he's, he lectures here and was explaining to me, um, in the context of this unit anyway, in labor law, um, which is taught as a compulsory unit in our law school over two semesters. So it's actually two separate subjects. Um, and in Australia, at least, I don't know about Murdoch, uh, Murdoch, it's a good combination, <laughs> Murdoch and Monash, but at, at least where I studied, it was not a compulsory unit. Employment law or labor law, it was an elective. So that's interesting, uh, at least that comparison and the fact that they literally end up spending what would be 150 hours of class time on employment law, really, in an Indian context, uh, almost all university students. Now, we don't have 150 hours, we've got one and a half. Uh, but Indranath is going to just talk about, you've got a case study in front of you, as I said, that's going to sort of form the foundation of uh, the issues you'll discuss. And I think you'll probably talk about unions, uh, minimum wages, rights of workers, uh, children and work, and potentially industrial actions and, and similar topics. Um, before opening the floor, if you guys have any questions on uh, labour law in, in the context of India. So I'll throw it over to you now. Thanks, Sean. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to you know, discuss a few things about labor law, of course. Um, wonderful to meet you all. Um, as Sean has explained, labor law is taught over you know, two semesters at Jindu. Um, it, it, it's quite important, you know, labor law. And I don't know much about Australia, but labor law, so far as India is concerned, is a very, very important subject. Um, we don't find, you know, sort of... Um, you know, of course, you know, things are sort of moving, but there are a number of questions that are attached to labor law, labor legislation in India. Probably we haven't even got to answer them all. So um, the idea was, um, you know, so you probably have one of these um, uh, piece of paper and there's a sort of a case study. And this case study generally talks about how, you know, how the situation is and what will happen to this person whose name is uh, Ram Dulari Ram, and he works at, at a big rubber factory. Um, and uh, it seems that th there is a change, um, you know, that's going to happen with the installation of a new machinery. Probably he's going to lose his job. Um, and there is a trade union too. Uh, trade union would surely take up this matter. Um, and so we are trying, we will try to identify uh, the rights that are associated. Uh, you know, uh, with Ram Dulari Ram and whether he can save his job, whether he can sort of ask for compensation, um, what can we possibly expect from the trade union, um, how they should behave, should they talk to the management, should they start agitation, should they break some windows, who knows. Um, so, before I say what I think about the problem, I would sort of, you know, and I would keep it like a you know sort of a discussion. Um, what do you think of maybe the one striking um, point or feature that you have come across? Anyone? It's open to the floor. In the problem, of course. Is there anything that you sort of think that oh that's strange? Or is it quite not out of the ordinary, it's normal. Of course, I understand that probably you have not been taught legal law in Australia, so that is that is understandable. But even if you haven't done, you know, still, as a lawyer, I guess it's important for you to sort of um, go through issues that probably could affect uh, people. What do you make of the, you know, I heard someone saying it's a big grub factory. Uh, what do you make of that big, why is it, is it just a term, redundant term that I've used? What is the, what is the, you know, requirement of using the word big in the problem? Large business. Large business. Uh, what does it signify? and employer and even small companies, so there are so many very different uh, goals in company as you know, 
So, of course, I'm very bad with names, but I'll try to remember, you know. Uh, so, what's your name? Elliot. Elliot. So, Elliot, tell me something. If I want to hire 50 odd people in my establishment, and there is another person, say my good friend Sean, who's going to hire, say, 100 odd people in his establishment, right? Um, would the relationship change between the employer and employees, or would it, it will remain the same? From a labor law perspective, I'll be a better boss. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 if we if you stick within the labor law framework, you know, would double that the employees. double the employees? Would that make any change? You know, would that be change the situation altogether? Would they unionize and stuff? Ah, that's a good point. So essentially, which means that whether formation <coughs> of a trade union is dependent on the number of employees, that's a question. So, if I have 50, you know, they are not entitled to form, any, form a union. And since Sean would have 100, you know, there's a big chance, high chance of a trade union there, right? Is that how it is done? That's a question. Um, so, from a labor perspective, when I say big, essentially, you're right, Elliot, in saying that large number of employees. Uh, here also, we have to sort of differentiate between an employee and a worker, because these are the two terms, you know, can we use them interchangeably? We can't, because there is reason why there are two terms, you know, who is an employee, who is a worker. Uh, what kind of rights a worker would have, like the employees wouldn't have? You know, is there a different contract that is between an employee and an employer? Um, and it's a completely different relationship between a worker and an employer. This is something that we have to sort of, you know, also understand. Going back to the big rubber factory, so far as the Indian, you know, uh, legal legislation goes, um, when it is big, um, the responsibilities remain the same, right? Instead, you know, you still have to pay the wages, you still have to pay the holidays, you still have to do certain things within the labor framework, labor law framework. However, there are some additional responsibilities. When you, you are part of a big factory, you have to inform, say for instance, here we have Lam Dulali Ram. Now there is a case where probably he would know, you know, he would probably, uh, wouldn't be able to continue his job, right? Now, there are certain procedures before you can say that, you know, thank you very much for your service, but you are no longer required, right? Now, if it is a big factory, meaning you have more than, you know, so, so far, the labor legislation for more than 100, right? Then, what you need to do essentially is to inform the concerned authorities, meaning the government, right? Be it the central government, be it the state government, depending on the kind of organization that you're running. You have to inform, and that is, you know, respective of the number of employee or worker that you are sort of, you know, uh, laying off. Again, I'll come, what does it mean to lay off? Um, and you have to inform and you have to sort of wait for the notice, so on and so forth. You have to pay compensation. Of course, you still have to pay compensation for others. But is that that there is, you know, there is an, uh, there is an additional layer that you have to fulfill uh, before you can start the process of, you know, um, say that, you know, thank you for your service. Um, so therefore, there is absolutely, it's very important to understand where you stand you know, from an employer's perspective, if you are managing an establishment where there are a number of people, right? So you still have to do many things as an employer like me would do for 50 or employees, but if Sean were to sack an employee or a worker, he has to do something more, right? Now, the question is, so, what is the, what is the procedure? Now, one of the major legislation, and this is something that is taught over two semesters, um, it's difficult to actually, you know, finish this. This one is the Industrial Disputes Act. This is the major legislation that is there in India. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the year when this act was enacted is very important for us to understand the overall framework. Uh, this act was enacted in 1947, okay? Why do you think it's important? Absolutely. Thank you very much. 
So the act was enacted um, in the background of uh, a lot of discontent amongst workers. Uh, India, while India um, got her independence, um, it was not a good situation so far as industry, you know, the industrial setup goes in India. Um, and therefore, uh, it was quite imperative, quite important on the part of the then legislature to actually frame out something that would benefit uh, both workers and the employer. Of course, if you read literatures about the Industrial Disputes Act, often you will come across arguments saying that well, you know, Industrial Disputes Act is more about how um, employers are responsible all the time, you know, not much sort of responsibility assigned to workers. But that's not true or correct uh, for the simple reason that the overarching objective of Industrial Disputes Act is to maintain that peace and harmony. Industrial Disputes Act, although the name suggests that it's sort of looking after disputes, it's also about to how to prevent disputes. So if you are unable to prevent disputes, then probably the dispute, that kind of dispute would happen. So for instance, if I'm unable to pay compensation uh, to Ram Dulari Ram at the time when he has been sacked, uh, there would be a dispute. So under law, you are responsible to pay compensation. So, the Industrial Disputes Act is sort of, you know, um, as a mixed bag. Uh, it sort of balances out um, the challenges that probably would come, uh, you know, both for the workers as well as for the employer. Now, how, you know, what are the responsibilities? So, this is something that someone was asking about the rights of the workers and rights of the employers. It is important to understand both. Um, when it comes to, you know, rights of uh, workers, the first uh, would be, you know, we talk about uh, compensation and so far as this, this case study is concerned. Compensation, how do you determine compensation? Um, so, before we determine compensation, I think it's very important to understand the framework, overall framework of, okay, if this person is leaving this job, what is it actually it means, right? Uh, do we have a term for that? That is important because compensation is connected to that term. There are a number of you know terms that are associated. Oh uh, well, uh, in the, in this you know, with this problem and also with other you know related uh, issues. One is layoff. The second one is retrenchment. Uh, they they are quite you know different. Uh, what is what is layoff? What is retrenchment? Well, layoff is something where a person can be laid off even for a couple of hours. It is neither the fault of, um, of an employer or the workers. Um, it is a situation, say, purely based out of natural, you know, say maybe uh, there, has been a, there has been flood in, in an area, right? And, uh, the, and therefore, there is a shortage of coal. Um, and uh, and therefore and surely the employer would be able to run the, the factory uh, until you know uh, he gets supplied from a different source. Now under the, under the circumstances, of course, the employer would be able to offer anything, uh, say for um, for a couple of hours, and day off uh, can go on um, for you know cannot go on cannot go on for a period of more than 45 days. And if the situation um, goes beyond 45 days, then there is a case for retrenchment. Now, when it comes to why do we actually need to bother about hey, this 45 days, uh, uh, you know, um, 45 days and why we need to change our situation from being a situation where uh, people have been laid off to retrenchment, That's simply, Layoff essentially deals with a situation which is temporary in nature. So that means situation that can be resolved and something that can be, you know, can, can change quickly. But if it is not changing for, you know, for a considerable amount of time, here 45 days is the time limit, then probably the situation, we should revisit the situation and think about the compensation in a very different way. 
and therefore the process of retrenchment. So in this case, you know, it can be a situation where it is not beyond the control of the employer. So the employer can decide, well, um, I want to install machinery. So therefore, uh, it is connected to the installation of the machinery, his sort of, uh, you know, um, the, the retrenchment. So it is more likely to be retrenchment here instead of layoff because it is. Uh, so if it is retrenchment, then of course, and if it is a big rubber factory, the employer must be or should follow a certain process. Of course, we don't need to get into, you know, as I told you, you know, briefly that uh, what those processes are, but essentially it's, it's notifying, notifying the, the appropriate authority. Now the question is, uh, what, what happens, what, if, if there, no, there is a, there is a trade union that is involved, right? Uh, and I sort of want, want to understand uh, what, what you understand by a trade union. What is a trade union? Is there any, you know, any thoughts that you might have? Yeah, sure. A union of workers who signed up to a, a sixteen week course which helps on their pay. <coughs> Basically a fee which helps to run the union, which allows them to organize strikes on other forms of action to improve their working conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other thought? So, something very important, thank you very much. Um, you said about collective bargaining, that's one. And you also said about how to elevate them. Why do you think that there is such requirement of elevating workers to a standard of similar to the employer? Why is you know, there such a requirement? Yeah, please. Um, thank you. So I think the situation is, you know, probably we can use uh, an example to understand why it is important to elevate them to the standard of the employer. Um, think of a, a remote place. Um, since we are in India, let's consider India. Um, and remote place, there is one factory. Now that factory uh, probably, you know, and, and workers uh, must walk for miles to and no transport nothing so must you know sort of travel for a while to actually reach the factory and since there is only one factory uh, so there is no option for them to go to a different place or to do a different employer and therefore they are you know to start with their in a, in a, in a situation which probably is not I wouldn't say that's an advantage situation when it comes to uh, in looking for employment. So, but what is the what is the role of a trade union? The trade union cannot, you know, create jobs, of course, right? They cannot, uh, okay, they can say collective bargaining, right? That's fine. What does it mean, by the way, collective bargaining? That's interesting. What does it mean? Oh, anyone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> where someone's vulnerability, which is the fact that they might not get a job at all because someone's willing to out-compete them, is removed by the fact that all of the, the collective agrees not to allow each other to compete for, the, for that. For instance, if someone's got a lower wage, uh, a low wage, and someone having no option, no income, will take an even lower wage, then they agree not to do that to each other so that collectively they can have a higher wage. Okay. Um, can you stop anyone from receiving, say, a, you know, a low wage? And we haven't, you know, sort of discussed minimum wage, but is it is it something that um, 
can you stop that thing from happening? Because so far as India goes, um, we have situations where people are sort of, you know, um, not receiving minimum wage for that matter. Um, they are taking whatever they're getting basically. So, and that situation is even worse because um, employment opportunities again, you know, from my staff example, um, there wouldn't be that many factories and that means there wouldn't be that many jobs in that remote place. So whatever comes their way, they would sort of take it. So it's a take it and leave it situation. So how do we see the role of trade union when there is a take it or leave it situation? Yeah, Elliot. Yeah. Sorry, I remember your name. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm too trying. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's not, well, at least it's more difficult to fire the entire union. The negotiating power of multiple people who present much higher value as employees, you know, slash workers combined to the company than, you know, every single individual component of that group, you know, is, creates a situation where, you know, they, ha they have so much more negotiating power that it's, you know, you as an employer is very constrained in terms of what kind of decision you can make. Of course, you can fire them all, but you know, it depends on the you know market conditions, availability of workforce, and the geographical location of your enterprise. I think that's very interesting. And you know, as a lawyer, I always think of these important terms. You just constrained. You know, why do you use constrained? You know, in relation to an employer, why um, functioning of a trade union would possibly constrain uh, an employer? Well, we have different incentives. Like, employ employer and employees have very different set of incentives. As an employer, I seek to minimize my cost, optimize my, you know, efficiency of my enterprise, maximize revenues, and sometimes, well, workers are just one of the factors of production. Um, as any factor of production, you seek to optimize it, you seek to maximize, you know, value, and, you know, what kind of result it provides. So, if this component doesn't function as well as you want, or doesn't, you know, doesn't use hundred percent of its capacity. Of course, you would seek you know, to improve as a result. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a you know um, it's a potent argument. You know, efficiency vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, labor law um, and trade union for that matter. I, I think uh, again, you know, um, I, I you know I, I I think the important aspect is that when you are um, reading law. Um, that to labor law, I think there it's equally true for other uh, areas of law as well. Uh, we have to sort of go back in history and understand, you know, how it happened, right? Um, as you can see, or probably you would know already, Trade Unions Act of 1926. So that was uh, before Indian independence. Now, of course, um, why trade union is something very interesting um, and that goes back to the formation of the Labour Party in the United Kingdom in 1900. Uh, anyone from the UK? Okay. Um, so you probably would know the, the birth of the Labour Party in 1900. Um, now, India was, n was nowhere, right? It was... Um, I mean, again, this is history, you know. Um, India was nowhere uh, so far as uh, the rights of workers concerned are concerned. Um, uh, you know, collective bargaining, um, also um, issue of elevation, there's no question, you know. But things uh, started to happen with the formation of uh, ILO, or the International Labour Organization. And in 1914, if I remember correctly, they actually asked for some kind of Indian representation at ILO. And that led to the formation of, you know, sort of, after, of course, after nine, ten years, led to the formation of the Trade Unions Act of 1926. Funnily enough, uh, it was known as, up until 1964, I believe, as Indian Trade Unions Act. It was not Trade Unions Act, it was Indian Trade Unions Act. Of course, the term Indian was repeated. So it was, uh, you know, mostly for in Indian. So that that's the that so that's for Indian Trade Unions Act. Now, so far as collective bargaining goes, you know, we have to again, you know, dig deep in history and understand. Um, so, of 
course, you know, there, it was really difficult times for the workers. Really, really difficult times for the workers. Um, they had they had nowhere to go. Uh, there was no concept of you know trade union or union for that matter um, until you know people started to you know sort of they join hand join hands together and said that you know something must be done about this uh, extortion. Um, and the working conditions must improve, wages must improve. So how do you go about it? Well, um, in India, um, for, for a considerable amount of time, um, this, uh, so when they um, joined hands, that amounted to some kind of conspiracy against the employer. Now, for a long time, of course, uh, this was in the framework of Indian in, in the in the framework of Indian Penal Code. It was um, something um, a criminal conspiracy. So uh, that was a problem, you know. So if you are charged um, under Section One Twenty B of the Indian Penal Code, therefore you probably would land up in jail. So you talk to each other, you conspire, you sort of think of improving your conditions. You probably would start with some kind of agitation and you probably, the next stop would be jail. So this continued for a long time. So this concept of collective bargaining, you know, uh, came at a, much, at a much later stage. Although the ethos, as you have rightly pointed, of, of a trade union's collective bargaining, that, that came at a much later stage. It was something that, a term that we have borrowed in India and mostly was used in the UK, uh, was uh, mutual, you know, there was, um, so mutual assurance is something that you know, we sort of borrowed, where people used to, or workers used to look after each other. They used to accumulate money and whenever someone is need, they used to, you know, sort of give out that money. Now, the problem of course in the Indian context was there was no money. Right, so there was no money coming in, which was possible in somewhere in, in, in a place like United Kingdom was not possible in um, in India, and of course, you know, um, in the United Kingdom as well, it was not that easy. You know, um, in the, after a long struggle, even after the formation of the Labour Party in 1900, um, it was a, it was a long struggle, and probably you would know. Um, that um, so what what created the problem in England was uh, a division of uh, a fund for the, the for the for the employed for the workers and funds that are given to political parties. So trade unions were you know were giving out funds to Labour Party and that led to the uh, quite a bit of you know sort of tussle. But never mind. Coming back to India, um, so. Mutual assurance out of the way. Then something, you know, again, and when there was some recognition given that, okay, you can still, you can still talk to each other, you can still work together, and there would be no chance of you landing up in jail. And that is where, you know, the concept of collective bargaining, you know, sort of started to happen. And that was not until, of course, the enactment of the Treaty in SAC. There were certain restrictions too. The other thing which probably, um, you know, is equally important was political allegiance of trade unions. How trade unions, and this is something that you, you know, some of you already said, how trade unions would ensure that workers would have certain rights, how trade unions would ensure that workers, their conditions, you know, uh, they would be better off. So they started to sort of, you know, give away funds from whatever they used to collect to political parties. Those political parties, once they were elected, they would sort of look after trade union or workers. That was the ob objective. Of course, that has earned, you know, now it's in a, in a, in a state of, um, well, people are asking questions about this whole idea of giving away funds to political parties. Because trade unions now, they have been looked as trading as a disruptive force, constraint that what is quite important. Of course, they are not, but you know this. You know they they, they are still you know following the path where they are still feeling um, uh, 
um, sort of money and they are expecting that things will work in their favor but sometimes what happens that you know some things are done uh, things are not necessary but still sort of there is some kind of agitation that is going on so of course the both sides of the argument you know people people would say that you know no no it's very important for workers to have uh, that and again something very interesting and something that you said about they have their individual interests there is no um, limitation as to how many trade unions can be there in an organization there is no such limitation so therefore say for instance in an organization like um, air india right uh, there was a there was a quite you know in famous case you know and uh, at that point of time air india had 13 trade unions registered trade unions so you can imagine uh, what would happen to collective bargaining and these trade unions had their own political affiliations and political affiliations means that political parties would have their own individual interests therefore what would happen to the rights of the workers so so the situation is quite complex and so trade unions as I was saying that you know if you look back in history you understand that how sort of it evolved trade unions could be registered could be unregistered trade unions as well but in order to um, have the safeguard of certain immunity under the trade unions act it is important that trade unions are registered um, and registered trade unions are probably would have more members as well so but in a situation like this, you know, where, you know, going, coming back to our problem, what would be the general approach? What should be the general approach of this trade union? Um, can the trade union sort of start agitating based on the fear that probably Ram Bhubari Ram would lose his job? That's one. Should the trade union, you know, sort of agitate? What, what should be the role of the trade union in this situation? What should be? Or what, what should be? Like, for instance, if you are representing the trade union or workers in the trade union, should you care about Ram Bulari Ram? That's the first thing. Politically, yes. Practically, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. How do you mean practically not? Well, you know, to show, to indicate to the members of the union that you do care about the situation, that you would take action against the employer if, you know, the action, you know, they want to fire or lay off this particular employee slash worker. Uh, but, you know, what legal basis do you have for making any kind of action against the employer? If not laying off that, you know, person, yes. Um, you know, if, and you don't know if that is actually going to happen. Maybe that, you know, person would get more training or would get moved to another position in the managerial role. So you do not know. And, you know, in the long run, if you try to help that employee, you might actually hurt them. Having an open conflict with an employer, you know, would just put that person into unfavorable position because of boss. And you know, as a boss, and just from pure psychological perspective of your human relationship, if someone is trying to defy your authority, you will do anything to you know punish that person. Okay, so you're saying that the trade union should wait until something happens. They should demonstrate the cons that they're concerned about the situation, but should do nothing. Okay, now that's, that's, I think it's a typical situation, the demonstration and doing nothing. What is it, so how, what is the utility of demonstrating that you're not happy with certain decisions, or probably you wouldn't be happy with you know, certain decisions that might actually um, affect the rights of the worker. Is it important that if I say that other than Ram Gulari Ram, there is another worker, you know, there are two more workers there, um, and not one now. Probably it would affect 50 of workers. Would that make any difference then? Uh, from being just one worker and therefore, you know, let's not talk about it. Let's, um, is, that, is that how we, we should, uh, should proceed if you are representing a trade union? Like a new 
media reports and it's growing fiat, so I think it's perhaps the move as well to talk to management and get some clarity about mm -hmm. the situation and um, figure out a way that the employees could be benefited in the future and perhaps by training them something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can can a sort of a trade union stop that uh, this person has been now um, say retrenched? Can the can a trade union stop? Anyways, better not. Better not. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at the you know the functioning of a trade union, if you think of um, a trade union should act, and then this is what usually happens. A trade union usually would act when there is a you know growing fear. They probably wouldn't wait until that actually the thing has happened, um, because if what has happened to one um, of the workers uh, in the factory, that can even happen to other workers uh, in a similar in a similarly situated uh, in a manner. Now, if that is so, then um, the trade union probably would sort of ask the management and ask for further clarification. If the management says, and this is what starts the dispute, that no, we are not interested, we are not going to give you any explanation. This, we cannot continue with this person. Uh, by installing the machinery, will increase the efficiency, that will probably increase the growth, that will probably ensure that we hire more people, that will improve our business. And therefore, we wouldn't like you to interfere in this matter. What is the recourse then? So, on one hand, you have a situation wherein it's going to work in the favor of the workers in the long run. And on the other hand, you have a situation, a temporary situation, as explained by the employers, that you know there could be one person or maybe few people would have to leave the job. So how do you, you know, how do you ensure that there is collective bargaining there? How would you ensure? The application of collective bargaining. Would you say that you know because it's going to be, um, you know, will work in favor of most of the workers in, in the long run, and therefore, we should not think of you know, the immediate problems. What would you say? Bodies of survivors have to cut off their individual organs. Okay. And in the long run, that will benefit. But okay, okay, okay. But can you sort of connect surgeon to uh, to a functioning of a trade union? Okay. Um, but uh, what 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 would you think? I mean, maybe someone else can answer as well. Uh, you want to? You want to go? Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's absolutely fine. Um, but this is a general question. How would you go about, you know, uh, in sort of uh, ensuring that even that one person's right is sort of is there, you know, is respected? See, the, here we have you know, two terms that are quite important. One is an individual dispute, and another one is an industrial dispute. Now, why these two terms are important? Because individual dispute could be as a result of maybe a disciplinary action, you know, something that may not affect the large number of workers. Industrial dispute uh, would have, and as the name suggests, would affect a large number of workers. But then again, an individual dispute, depending on the nature of the dispute, can actually turn into an industrial dispute. Therefore, you know, a trade union should be very, very careful and cautious about you know, their approach in you know, dealing with any matters like this. So if it has happened to one, it could be, <coughs> excuse me, if it, happened, it has happened to one, it, could be, it can happen to others too. 
there is no guarantee. So, you know, would the trade union then ask for uh, a, a sort of an agreement? Should there be an agreement between the trade union and the, and the management saying that, you know, in the long run, how that would benefit? Should we wait for, you know, facts and figures? Before saying, Yo, okay, we'll let go one person and ensure that it's long-term benefit. So there is no, you know, sort of, um, it, it, it is quite a difficult question and in a situation wherein um, a person may not actually be able to, an employer may not be able to sort of give out exact facts and figures about, this is what I predict, this is what I expect, and this will be, you know, uh, for the benefit of uh, majority of workers, these fees. Um, could there be participants in the trade union if they jump into a, like with the individual? Difficulty. Now, <clears throat> so far as, um, you know, Indian legislation you know, label institution goes, there is no hard and first rule for an employer to actually recognize the trade union, right? Um, however, if it is a majority trade union, uh, meaning that most of the workers are, uh, again, there is a slight, you know, we have to take it with a pinch of salt because if, if in an establishment we have 13 odd trade unions, mostly the majority trade union would be say 20% representing 20% of the workforce or even less. Yeah. So we don't know, you know, talking about collective bargaining, that 20% would be sort of representing the remaining 80%. So there is a conflict there. A trade union, um, often, and in the past, and it has, it's still happening, they would be loggerheads with the, the management, mm -hmm. right? That would lead to disruption of work. Mm -hmm. That would lead to, you know, uh, negative growth, that would lead to multiple other situations. However, uh, there is a change in how things were when you know trade unions started to coming up, and how things are right now. So often there is you know there is an argument that you know in in big organizations why can't the HR or the human resource replace the trade unions if it is to do with you know workers' rights and so on and so forth they can talk to the you know higher management and they can but this was this this argument is sort of negated by a counter argument saying that hr is hired by the company then so you 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 can't sort of rely on them so we are in a quandary and you know because of the because of one on one hand you have the rights of the workers and on the other hand you have the employer who would like to carry on with the business um, and an employer, you know, um, would not necessarily actually um, say that I wouldn't recognize a trade union when actually the majority of workers have signed uh, with that trade union. So that is, that is, you know, they wouldn't naturally do it. Of course, you had a visit uh, to the, the JSBL plant. Where, where did you go to? Uh, Angul. Angul. So uh, did you see any trade union there? Did you ask? No, there is no trade union. But that, again, that, that depends on, uh, you know, um, how, how, you know, even there are organizations, you know, successful organizations um, and big organizations like the Tata of, of India, you know, there are not that many trade unions. It's mostly internal. Something which is also very important, you can still have a union and not a union which is affiliated to a political party. Now that is quite important because all the problems are coming that way, you know, um, that when a political, there is certain political allegiance, you know, you would sort of try to sort of um, enter into a situation where um, you're in a much better position, you know, so far as bargaining is concerned. And therefore, that probably would affect the, the, the working of the factory or or the establishment. So that is something that probably we need to sort of look at. Now, so that's, you know, uh, do you have any questions about trade unions? I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, please. So in the context of, context of India, do trade unions represent the seat on the board of directors of the company? And are there cases when tra trade unions as entities, legal entities get equity within the company? No, no. So, so, 
Yeah, so no for both. Trade unions essentially would probably be represented, but they wouldn't be taking... See, what, what essentially happens, uh, a member <coughs> would sit in all the, all the meetings, right? That probably would affect the workers, but it is up to the management whether the, they would listen to that person. Again, uh, it is for the mutual benefit, you know, to listen to that person and ensure that, you know, it is minimized. So it is more of a negotiation process that happens. Um, but again, it depends on the organizations whether they would like to have, you know, a trade union member who is representing the workers uh, to be a part of the board and to be a part of, but it is, so for instance, the Air India example that I was referring to, Air India, so there was some kind of arrangement with, uh, with Singapore and they were, uh, you know, they tried to sort of have some machinery from Singapore and that would increase the efficiency in the, at, the, at the airports. So of course, Air India being the national carrier, right, they wanted to do it, but the trade union said that they were not informed, right, they were not informed. Now, the question is, yes, you can inform, uh, but what if the trade union members would say no to that? So what is the next step? So there is, we are already on conflicting path. So that, that, would, that would happen. And that would happen as long as there is, um, you know, so far as we are not on equal, equal bargaining terms, you know. So therefore, uh, people would like to, an employer would like to, and sort of cut down on in the influence of the trade unions, of course. Through good practices, employer would do that, you know. So if you're paying your wages on time, if you're sort of giving bonuses, if you're giving, you know, ensuring that you have hospitals, you have everything, so you have less things to complain about. And if you have more things to complain about, then you have, you know, trade unions. And in a, in mostly in, in, um, in public organization establishments, um, you have many trade unions. And that affects, that surely affects the working of that establishment yeah yeah um, so okay, should we should we move yeah, to the next yeah we'll keep you out of question yeah sure well let us think of this situation one fine morning you're saying there are no workers in the establishment <laughs> Okay, and uh, and you have to deliver, say, something uh, uh, to say a different country, and you don't have workers. You have a deadline to to manage to match, and and that that has resulted because the night before you had a you had an argument. <laughs> with one of the trade union members and said they threatened they said you know if you don't listen to us you know tomorrow we will be on a strike so there is always this <coughs> um, you know uh, fear you know that there might be some problem however there are you know we must have you know certain caveats here one again this big factory would be interesting and important if it is, if the trade union would call for a strike and if it's a big factory, then you can't call for a strike just like that. Again, you have to provide notice. You, without a notice, you, any strike would be considered illegal. So therefore, you wouldn't possibly have compensation. So as a trade union, as a trade union, you should provide the notice, a notice of you know 14 days, and within that probably would try to resolve the problems or differences. Um, but if if that fails, probably you you know go for a strike. But but that would give that window of opportunity you know to the to the employer <laughs> to sort of look for other alternatives or talk to the trade union members. Um, but there is always this you know fear. So the second. Um, Trade union cannot, and there must be a trade dispute, so to speak, cannot, you know, use this opportunity and knowing fully well that, you know, there is a large shipment going out of the factory, there is a deadline, there's a new contract, and therefore it is, you know, very important for the employer to do that. You can't take that opportunity, you know, to, to, to bargain. 
So that is that is that will be counterproductive. So that would not sort of give them the leeway, and if the matter goes to the court, then probably that will be counted against them. So there must be a real dispute, so so to speak. If you want to call for a strike, then you must give notice. And similarly, if there are you know so. It is not only limited to trade union that you know that you know they can call for a strike, but also an employer. Say an employer is not very happy with the functioning of the trade union, or for that matter, the workers. What are the possible up? You know, the, what are the options that are available for you know for 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 an employer? Well, the employer can equally call for a lockout. So if the if the uh, the trade union can call for a strike, the employer has this weapon. Which is lockout. Lockout is basically, it's sort of a you know uh, my response to your strike. Um, but again, the employer has a you know uh, the employer uh, it cannot call for a lockout if again this big is important or because there are certain responsibilities equally it could be hampering the workers. So therefore, there must be a notice. So there could be a situation wherein you know um, an employer is not happy with a strike. That's why the strike is on. The employer call for a lockout, and of course these are the cases that have happened in India where you know both the employer and the workers have asked for compensation. Of course, in that situation, the court had to sort of look into the situation, what led to what, and whether at any point uh, either the strike or the lockout was illegal. And the court said that, well, you know, if, you, if you're part of a big establishment and there is a strike that is already there happening, and if you call for a lockout as a response to the strike, then your lockout would not be deemed to be legal, right? The, um, however, if you continue to continue with the lockout, even after the workers have come back, or they would like to come back, right? That would need to be uh, an illegal lockout. So therefore, the compensation would be divided accordingly, right? So how do you share the blame? So the Industrial Disputes Act, as I told you, is not about just the rights of the workers, but it's also about the rights of the, the employers too. So therefore, if there are certain conditions, preconditions to be met before you can call for a strike, there are equal conditions, you know, that must be uh, carried out by an employer before the employer can actually call for a lockout. So, and that balances out. So, um, so therefore, uh, a trade union would not necessarily be. Again, uh, things are better now, but I, I don't think, you know, I, I think we have miles to go before we can say that there is complete harmony in, and there wouldn't be because. That is how there there are two very different positions, you know, from the employer and the workers. You had a question. Yeah. You say it's illegal for an employer to use their power of lockout that if the if the employees strike. Do you say it's illegal or legal if they do it? Okay. So so again it depends on uh, the number of workers that you have. In your in your factory or in your establishment, so if the workers number of workers uh, is, is more than hundred, then you have to provide certain notice. Now, and there would be a notice period, and that notice period you have to call for a strike, uh, call for a lockout. Now, what my situation, what I was trying to explain was, what if think of a situation where there is a strike that is already there or already happening in the in the factory whether you still have to notify and what would be the consequences if you were to call for a, for a lockout. Well, if there is a strike and if you call, call for a lockout, you know, as a response to the strike, ongoing strike, then you're, you don't need to notify, further notify, because you don't need to notify anyone because there isn't anyone. They're already on the strike. However, um, if the workers would like to come back, because you know there could be a situation where in, probably they have been able to resolve their differences, and they would like to come back and say that you know we would like to continue with our work and you know let's let's work together. Therefore, there is no longer a strike, and if there is no strike, and the reason why you call for a lockout has ended now, then there is no reason, right? Then 
your continuation of that knockoff would be deemed illegal from the date when the strike has been called off. Otherwise, you still have to sort of, you know, if there is no um, strike that is there or pending strike, um, then probably you wouldn't, um, you, you would need to have or need to provide certain, certain notices. Now, then the other, you know, so the Trade Unions Act and the Industrial Disputes Act, these two are major, you know, so far as India is concerned, and of course, industrial disputes, and there are a number of other aspects to industrial disputes. What we have talked about are certain definitional terms which would give us some sort of idea as to, you know, how, what kind of, what, what are the rights of the workers, what are the rights of the employers for that matter. The other important, equally important, you know, other acts are like the, the Minimum Wages Act, the Employees' Compensation Act, uh, the Maternity Benefit Act, and something very, very important is the Contract Labor Regulation and Abolition Act of 1970. Now, moving on to the, you know, like, um, the, the Minimum Wages Act, what, what do you understand by minimum wage? What is minimum wage for you in a labor law context? So maybe a minimum wage in terms of worker on an hourly basis? Mm -hmm. So how do you decide on minimum wage? How do you, how, how do you say that, you know, uh, well, you have to pay someone, and this is something that I'm making up, it's not that. You have to pay something which is, say, 500 rupees a day um, if you're employing someone, right? And that's the minimum wage that you've said. How do I come to that number, right? 500 is something that, what are the considerations legal, before I, yeah, please. Legal requirements in the country or a state for a minimum wage, mm -hmm. but like they can guide you make a decision. So if I want to say that, Elliot, can you sort of explain what minimum wage is instead of giving me, say, a number, say, 270, well, right? Uh, So when you say minimum wage, does it mean that um, uh, is it for only sustenance or is it for, you know, which should also take care of your kids, uh, should pay the tuition, should pay the uh, food, uh, hospital, pension, and what is it, minim what minimum wage is then? As the business is not, it's basically not your concern. Ah. So there's a government that establishes it and you have to follow it, but like, what kind of is the, you know, minimum morality of the law and like whatever you can you know, pay for your kids tuition with that amount is not your concern. Mm -hmm. So at this time of setting, you know, whoever set this minimum wage, say be the government or the local authority, right, or the state government, would they not take into consideration that, you know, if you, if I, if an employer pays, say, 500 rupees, right, they wouldn't even boil the water. Yeah, please. See, there is um, it's a very good question, and there is a you know, constitutional law dimension to minimum wage too. So, minimum wage essentially is for bare sustenance, unfortunately, but that is what that is that is true. You cannot survive on minimum wage. You just cannot survive. Um, however, if it is guaranteed, why is it guaranteed, and who guaranteed? Well. Uh, the Indian constitutions, the Constitution of India suggests that if you're paying someone um, less than minimum wage, then that would amount to forced labor. And that is not allowed under the Indian Constitution. And therefore, you must pay minimum wage uh, regardless of the situation that you're in. So you may not be making enough money, but that is not an excuse to say that, you know, I'm not in a position to make 
wage if you're not if you're unable to pay minimum wage then probably you should run the business in the first place so that's that's the sort of what the court has to say in many 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 cases now however when you say that you are guaranteeing something or you are if this is guaranteed you know that you will get constitution you can't then then the employer must be you know or should be in a position to also sort of ensure that uh, a fair wage or a living wage is paid but we are at still to into in still in uh, if we consider 2017 you know we haven't been able to sort of guarantee um living wage or fair wage for that matter um that is our aspiration the supreme court of india has said that you know if we say that the it is a you know guaranteed by indian constitution that the employer will be forced to pay when possibly the employer may not be in a position to pay a fair wage or living wage let us at least agree to the fact that the employer must pay minimum wage while we aspire for living wage or fair wage and how they are different from minimum wage living wage or fair wage well um living wage and fair wage would essentially include you know some sort of social security when you are possibly would be able to you know go to work um uh, your old age um your probably um the cost that you probably would incur uh, in hospitals um for your for your treatment um so on and so forth however um uh, that itself again it depends on if an employer is paying minimum wage you can't take the employer to court saying that you know you should also pay fair wage and living wage you can't you can bargain of course through a trade union but you can't force because an employer would be paying minimum wage as per the requirement uh but we are you know probably we we would be in a situation where minimum wage uh, would sort of transfer into you know fair wage and living wage and things would become better um the the other aspect which probably you know um has not been talked about uh, you know i'm i'm working on a on a on an edited volume with one of my colleagues and um uh, and and this concerns uh domestic workers or the help you know that you get in households and this this again is very you know sort of um quite i wouldn't say interesting but i think quite concerning that uh, what about the rights of those workers uh what about minimum wage to them um because clearly we are in a situation which is informal in nature and whatever happens happens in the you know the, the household you probably wouldn't know as a government or an authority that what exactly is going on you wouldn't know exactly how much is paid oops that's me thanks sorry um so you wouldn't know you know um you wouldn't know exactly what is going on in that household and so we sort of sort of you know um we are looking at a situation where in how we have to extend the the formal contract system even in the household and to ensure that certain basic rights are there for workers regardless of the place of the work so this is something that we you know i'm working on with one of my colleagues and uh, so this is this is something that minimum wage is so whatever we are talking about remember something which is very very important that the labor legislation framework that we have in the country that takes care of a formal setup what about those countless you know who are in that informal economy which is probably unaccounted for right a person who is working in a household prob wouldn't be registered anywhere right uh there would there would be a signed contract between an employer and uh and that person um there would be any government government records for that person so how would you ensure that there's you know those rights are sort of you know clearly laid down properly similarly you know there are you know, you know that's one instance uh, there are situations where you know you talk about child labor and it's very interesting you know and very again very very 
concerning point that you talk about how it is prohibited, right? Um, you go to any roadside eateries in India, you'll see, you know, little kids. You can make out. You don't have to ask. You can make out how they're working. You know, they are less than 10, 14 years and they're working, right? Uh, and that's the worst part, you know, worst bit. They, we have got legislations, for instance, the Factories Act to ensure that kids below the age of 14 should work at places that are dangerous for their health. But what would you, how would you go about, you know, to regularize the informal economy? Because that is where the problem lies. There is nothing to, you know, sort of, uh, to support them. Um, so, so therefore, whatever structure we are talking about today, that's, that's primarily for, um, for the formal economy. Of course, in India in 2008, we had, um, you know, an act on unorganized workers, unorganized social security act. Uh, again, the question is, how would you implement that? You know, uh, is it, um, is it possible to, you know, sort of check each and every sort of, you know, uh, you go to a roadside eatery and just ask for employers to record, but they wouldn't have anything. It's all informal, right? It's paid in cash. You wouldn't know exactly what the minimum wage is. A child which is, who is probably less than you know, 10, 11 years old wouldn't necessarily know what minimum wage is. For that person, <coughs> um, earning money is important, right? That's, a, that's, that's, that's a true. And since earning money is important, whatever comes his or her way, that is taken without asking any questions. So um, we have to cover for this, you know, uh, minimum wage. Again, there's something. Again, it's it's not a satisfactory situation. Perhaps uh, it's not, and, and we have to improve on that. Um, the other um, issue is again there's something very important: Employees Compensation Act of 1923. <coughs> And this, the title of the act when it was first enacted was Workmen's Compensation Act. And now it has been extended to Employees' Compensation Act, which sort of goes to show that there is a difference between workmen or workers and, and employees. Um, workers essentially, you know, have been defined, you know, as someone or people who probably are working and are sort of uh, earning less than perhaps a supervisor. And not probably giving, you know, sort of, uh, have no supervisor, have, uh, workers have no supervisory control over, can't say that, you know, other workers should do certain work. So, uh, not playing the role of a supervisor, uh, not a manager, uh, but then, you know, there are, there are things that happen that uh, companies, establishment would essentially uh, give someone the designation of a supervisor or a manager just to avoid paying uh, certain, you know, just to sort of, you know, avoid paying certain money or, uh, you know, adhering to certain rights. So that is a do, but the courts have said that you, it's not um, what your designation is, but it's also about the kind of work that you that you do as a part of that establishment is important. That will decide whether, you know, you'll be treated as a, as a worker. So this Employees' Composition Act essentially talks about how and under what circumstances, you know, mostly in cases of accident and other situations, um, an employer would be liable to pay, liable to pay compensation uh, to, to an employee. And are there, you know, uh, un, 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 under what circumstances, um, the employer can sort of refer to the defense of contributory negligence on the part of the employee, <laughs> so on and so forth. It's quite, quite, um, quite important. Um, then, of course, another you know important legislation in India is the Maternity Benefit Act of 1961, and that itself, you know, that gives um, a right to um, uh, mothers, you know, not only just uh, before or after, but it's a sort of a continuous process wherein, you know, enough support is given to um, not the mother but the child as well. 
Um, again, the Act talks about how uh, expected mothers should not be given certain kinds of work and how they should be treated even after childbirth. And if, um, so th there is a formal structure and I believe that we are doing quite well, you know, uh, in this regard, that at least we have a formal structure. Again, um, as I've said before, the problem is with the informal you know, sector and not right the formal sector because that is all accounted for. You can check and you can regularize that sector. Um, the the last thing that I probably would like to discuss, of course, and I'll you know open the floor for questions. Um, the Contract Labor Regulation and Abolition Act of 1970. Now, this act is um, quite important because uh, you would come across establishments where uh, people would not be permanent employees. They would probably be hired for you know some work. They would be hired through contractors. Uh, they would be on the rolls. Um, so the question was before the legislature: Should we just remove all those workers and make them all permanent employees? But that was not you know the easy solution. It was not what is what what is required you know or what was required at that time at that time um, one thing they wanted to end was you know this as an excuse for an employer to not to hire any permanent employees the court through cases have said that if there is a situation wherein uh, the work that has been carried out by employers are uh, intermittent in nature where you don't need to hire permanent employees then it gives you enough reason to actually hire, um, you know, uh, temporary workers through contractors. Yeah. Sorry, what was the act name again? Contract Labor Regulation and Abolition Act of 1970. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so it is. Um, so therefore, you know. The conflict here is so the what the most of the cases that have gone to court that those cases that in those cases workers have tried to establish the relationship between an employer and and and, and them because clearly um, under this act you know uh, the employer can always claim that they are not my workers and therefore I'm not liable to pay uh, any well. I'm liable to do certain things, but I'm not liable under the Industrial Disputes Act because they are not my uh, workers. Um, and they are only hired through contractors. It's, 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 they are workers of that contractor and not my workers. Now, this relationship, so when it goes to the court, when these matters go to the court, they essentially would be, you know, workers would try to establish, no, no, we are actually... Uh, uh, workers of the employer and it's just the contractor is you know it's, it's a sham you know it's, it's 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 set up just to avoid the application of industrial disputes act and other acts uh, in india um so far you know they have been successful in sort of ascertaining that yeah well under circumstances uh possibly uh contractors are not the actual employers of this these workers and and they surely would be workers of the principal employer. So that the terms that we have under this act would be principal employer, contractor, and workers. Um, as it happens, uh, we haven't been able to sort of, you know, well, while the courts have suggested that, you know, it's, it's, it's if you are expecting contractual workers uh, every year, you know, every month, why not hire them permanently? Why not have them on your roles instead of hiring them through contracts, uh, to, through contractors? Uh, while the courts have said that, but they haven't been, in, in, been able to convince them for, of course, for obvious reasons. Um, but that, even if you are hiring through contractors, that doesn't mean that, you know, as an employer, you have no responsibilities whatsoever. You still have certain responsibilities, meaning you still need to sort of uh, ensure that wages are being paid on time by the contractors, 
when wages are being paid on time, there should be someone representing the company over the, the entire matter. Then, of course, um, you still need to ensure working conditions. You still need, you cannot allow contractors to hire kids to do the work for you. So, since it is your premise, you know you still have to ensure that there are you know certain sort of um, you know limitations so far as you know what the contractors can and cannot do. Um, and so, the minimum wage. Um, you know, argument would still sort of be there, of course, while the contractor is responsible for paying the minimum wage to the workers, but if the contractor is not doing it, then the employer should be made responsible to pay the minimum wage to the workers. <coughs> and on a timely basis, it can't be at any time in, 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 in a month. So, um, responsibility is there, you know, that there are certain responsibilities. Now, <coughs> so the if we think of you know sort of um, labor legislation in the country, so basically you know we have to sort of go back, go back in history and sort of understand when they were drafted. I must say um, there have been certain changes over the years in in in, in the in the basic structure, not in the basic structure, but you know additions and amendments that have happened in the Industrial Disputes Act. Um, however, we have not been able to sort of completely overhaul the structure because the structure is sort of fairly old. Of course, there could be an argument why you need to overhaul the structure if it works out fine. Of course, it doesn't. It doesn't, you know, it hasn't worked out properly because clearly um, India is, it's very diverse. Um, you, would, you would find majority of the workers in the informal economy you probably would not find workers on the same pedestal as the employers. Um, uh, you would find the, you know, the trade unions have their own interests, trade unions looking after the interests of the workers. So it is, it is quite um, a difficult situation to sort of, you know, to give a, a balanced. Only thing what we need to probably do is to have a nuanced approach to, you know, to, uh, to interpreting the the labor legislation, uh, labor laws in India. Um, surely we can improve, I don't know, mostly in relation to minimum wage, uh, you know, ensuring uh, maternity benefit rights are given to workers. Um, and, and more and more, so what is happening right now, uh, more and more employers are sort of, you know, sort of suggested that you should have more of your permanent employees so that their rights are, um, so that the, the rights of the workers are ensured. And you probably have heard of certain changes that are happening, uh, so far as India is concerned about the digital paying system, you know, bank accounts. So, you know, there are workers who wouldn't have a bank account. So how would you transfer money? You know, there is no option of, you know, um, so if, if you have a bank account, probably you can check how much you have received. Um, so there's a part of, on the part of the government, the government is trying to ensure that less and less of, you know, the things are more transparent, just to ensure that, you know, there are further checks and balances, and those checks and balances probably would sort of improve the livelihood of workers in the country. So I think I've spoken enough, but, you know, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Finding, finding an employee, uh, do you have to, to pay him or her like a compensation for let's say a few months of wages or something like that, like they do in Europe, or it's like more flexible, more like a U.S. style system? No, it is. So if you're firing an employee, again, it depends. And I, uh, if it is in the formal sector, and I would imagine formal that's sector. formal sector, right? You have to pay compensation, right? And you have to pay com compensation for a period of at least six months. Yeah, depending on you know how long that person has worked for, but not the entire salary. It's an average that is calculated. There is a formula, you know, which is used to calculate the amount of compensation. Um, again, you know, of course, you know, we lawyers would have a number of options. Meaning, you know, we come up with situations where we'll say that, you know, rich retrenchment compensation did not be paid for a number of other reasons, right? Uh, uh, but yes, it is. It is quite um, 
quite quite formal in nature in terms of that is a, there is a requirement of retrofitting compensation. Um, however, you would probably, um, you know, again, I'm probably repeating myself. The situation is not so good when it comes to informal economics, just higher and fire. So, why don't they, like, you know, in terms of for informal economics, mm -hmm. you just walk around Delhi, you see all those, you know, side road businesses, which clearly look illegal mm -hmm. in terms of like having any, you know, following any kind of uh, official requirements. Mm -hmm. Why can't authorities just, you know, force them either to shut down or oblige their regulations? Well, uh, one is livelihood. That's uh, that's one of the, the biggest concerns that we have. So that person who probably is, you know, maintaining a road territory, probably flouting all the norms, right? No safety standard, right? But still be able to employ, you know, five odd uh, people, right? And so it is it is a question of livelihood, but that shouldn't be an excuse to, you know, to 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 have those standards. Shouldn't have we that should be an excuse to say that you know we shouldn't have those standards in place. Uh, we are, I mean, we are, you know, uh, progressing towards you know formalizing whatever we have, right? But still, we have a long way to go. I don't think we have even you know scratched the surface for that matter. Um, roadside eateries, you know, you're talking about Delhi. You know, India is beyond Delhi. So and and when you you know go to villages, you know, how would you ensure that you implement those conditions, right? Those, those, those requirements. Um, we, you know, you, you think of um, a factory probably, and that factory, you know, is, it's, it's the only option that is available for workers. So, and therefore, the issue of, you know, bargaining is, is not there. You, know, you don't bargain. You just be happy with what you, whatever you have got. And this, and this you know, a, a sorry state, really, right? But maybe, you know, we need to do more on, on, on improving the situation. It is a vast area and it's very complicated. We actually thought of, and this is something you should, you should also know, uh, because there are multiple legislation, there are overlaps, there are conflicts, right? We thought of having, uh, coming up with a labor code, which would be, you know, a comprehensive legislation covering all aspects. Um, we haven't, you know, we haven't uh, got it as yet uh, because, you know, um, multiple reasons actually. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll have it someday and make it uh, more transparent in nature so exactly you would know what your rights are, you know. And something, you know, which is, which is very close to my heart, you know, that you, day-to-day uh, -day interaction with, you know, people maybe working, helping you out with your household yeah. thing, how much you're paying? You're paying pittance. You know, you're not even thinking of minimum wage. You know, if you want to pay minimum wage, and this is another perspective, if you want to pay minimum wage uh, to a full-time worker in Haryana, you're in the state of Haryana. I think, if I'm not wrong, I think the minimum wage is 220 or 230 rupees. Um, and um, and minimum wage is divided, you know, it's sort of it's categorized based on your skill set. So unskilled, skilled, semi-skilled, and highly skilled. Um, so if I were to employ uh, a person, you know, to, to take care of my domestic, or to take care of my house, then probably I have to pay close to 6,000 odd rupees, which is quite steep. Uh, why domestic workers, domestic health, this is an even an issue in India because, you know, because of cheap labor. So you can find a person who would actually do the work for you, you know, without creating much, fu much fuss. So be happy with whatever they gain, but that is where the extortion, you know, comes in. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a precarious situation we are in. It's, uh, but again, we are working towards that. You know, there are many, many other, uh, you know, legislations that are coming in to ensure that more and more rights are given. But again, India is a, is a vast country, is a very diverse country, and therefore, uh, multiple problems. So, like in case of this um, difficulties of uh, high, like firing people and have to pay them, you know, six months of salary, it might work 
for like you know low to low skilled workers, factory workers. So we're talking about you know high tech, <coughs> biotechnology, any kind of complicated, complex industries where uh, you have a limited number of professionals with very high salaries. You know, paying let's say someone with a high salary six months worth of salary is very difficult. Does Modi's um, government take any action to make it more business friendly for those kind of you know high tech? more advanced skills to make it easier for them to hire and fire employees? So that is where I get the difference of the difference between a worker and employee would come in place. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't be considered as workers. Ah, they wouldn't be considered workers. So they wouldn't be considered as workers. So you have an employment contract and that is where, you know, you it's between the employer and the employee, right? Mm -hmm. How much you're gonna give. Ah, so okay. Oh, okay. So therefore, you know, you probably, you know, if you're a worker then you have, you know, certain statutory rights, you know, I have my rights. Um, so, you know, it is, um, I don't think easily compensation are given as well. So really, um, labor law, labor legislation in India is not something which, we need to revisit number of issues, number of issues. Even the definition of worker has been defined differently in different legislations. It's, it's quite, quite difficult. And I understand why it has happened. Uh, because it has, you know, it's, it's about 100, 150 years of history, right? And it has happened at a number of stages. For instance, the Factories Act. And if you actually would go into the details of the, you know, the history of Factories Act in India. Factories Act in India was not passed because there was a requirement in India. It was passed because some protest happened in Manchester. That's, 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 that's a fact. Because Indian goods, there was no, you know, so, there were the deplorable conditions, uh, no fixed working hours. Um, so, of course, uh, things that were manufactured in India were cheaper than how, than what was manufactured in, in, in India or in the UK. So therefore, the workers uh, in the UK were really, really not very happy with how things were. So they sort of pressed upon the idea and therefore there were minimum working hours, number of hours that came in place. So if you go into the history, it's sort of more of, you know, that to make Indian goods competitive um, and to make, you know, their goods competitive and not, not really hard. So we were at a, you know, advantageous position. But this is how, you know, most of the legislation have been and labor legislation. Um, but yeah, I mean, the overall framework is, I mean, we have, I mean, it's not that we don't have, the, the framework is really strong. It is very, very comprehensive, but it's a question of implementation. How do we go about in implementing all that we have written as a part of statutes? Yeah? Yeah. What are the working hours in India? Eight hours. Eight hours. Eight hours is, good. but I'll give you all sort of, you know, uh, an idea of how things work. Um, so, when we were contemplating, you know, uh, of having a, a Factories Act in India, so we started with that, uh, well, what would be the age of a person, right, who is not an adult? We started with eight, eight years. Of course, that was the time when India was... Well, India was not independent. Eight, then ten, then eleven, then finally fourteen. Uh, fourteen years again is something you know you can't sort of expect that person to work in in specific areas. Um, so you know, fa so there are so Factories Act again is something which is quite quite important because it gives certain rules. It sets certain rules and regulations that you know you can't work for number of hours. You have to take some rest. You have to sure that you know you have um, certain rates in place there was one hand over there uh, you had a you had a question yeah i was just wondering are there any um like semi-formal or regulated institutions that affect workers that are not um i would say the ngos would do that the ngos would surely do that because i can give the example from the book that i'm authoring 
Mm, the NGOs actually started the movement of having something concrete for domestic health. Um, they have drafted uh, quite a few legislations, although sadly they were not passed. But they proposed a number of legislations, you know, um, and um, that sort of would suggest that they're sort of, you know, well aware of the rights and deplorable working conditions of, of domestic health. Um, as a part of my research, I have sort of interviewed um, uh, NGOs and and have said that, you know, the problem is that workers not always would come up, you know, to the NGOs to talk about these issues. And therefore, it is it is uh, just, you know, tip of the iceberg. You won't really know how many are in the problem, you know, in the zone. For instance, there is, for the workers, um, there is an insurance scheme uh, where you get, you know, you can attend to hospitals and you can have medical facilities uh, state run um, and and that scheme you have a card for that and that card you know all even domestic workers can have that card but again if you think of that card so you have to there is probably one hospital you know um, and you have to travel a lot to ensure that you reach that hospital and there are problems as well in implement. So I was saying that implementation there is a problem because, you know, hospitals need not, uh, or perhaps, and it has come through media reports only, they would necessarily recognize the, you know, the, the, the insurance scheme. Uh, and so there are, you know, processes in place, but I don't think, uh, we are la lacking so far as, you know, uh, surely when it comes to execution, absolutely. And there are schemes, government is spending a lot in terms of how to um, ensure that uh, these workers can sustain themselves. As I've said, the minimum wage is nothing. You know, if you come to think of it, uh, 270 rupees, that is nothing. That, I'm talking about a full-time worker, all right? Um, what do you do with that, you know? So how would you, so the overall question would be how would you transform the system so that people do not get paid pittance. That's the question. All these laws of the labor legislation that we have is for that reason only. But that I, I would say that you know we are still in the process of you know transforming ourselves uh, to make a in a better society. Yeah. Do you have an example of another NGO that would that Yeah, Seva. S E W A. So they have their website too. They're in Delhi, and you, if you want, you can probably you know just I don't know how uh, you are here for how long. You'll be here for till Saturday. That'll be too short. But anyways, you can always write to them and you maybe you know email them. So so I did visit their office in Delhi um, just to understand you know. Thank you.